we all have tough times, you know, losing kids, losing moms or dads, going through hard times in life. But the fact is, the true test of character, I think, and, and, and God will honor this, is a man or woman that is sought out to him and is following him through those tough times. As Jesus freaks, that's what we're called to do. And I think it's, it's, it's that message is timely for now and the past and the future. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We are on the road this week in Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to talk about a book that has impacted literally millions of people. Uh, and I am here with Michael Tate, the lead singer of the Newsboys, formerly part of DC Talk, as well as Dan Pitts, who is the co-manager and helped make this book happen. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the book Jesus Freaks with Michael Tate and Dan Pitts. Welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Hello, Todd. Good to be with you, my friend. Great to be here. Dan, I want to start with you because you're managing a band. They make music, and then all of a sudden they become authors and release a book. How did that happen? How did you go from music into books? There actually was a suggestion. I was at a, a ministry board meeting, and one of the guys on the board, actually John McGuire, he yeah. said, you know, have you ever thought of Fox's book, Martyrs? Do you ever thought about doing something with that and calling it Jesus Freaks? I was like, man, that's a really good idea. <laughs> it was in Old English, so we were like, if we could make it in modern language, you know, we'd take these stories and put them out. So a man named Pat Judd, who was at Allberry Publishing, but he said, what we want to do is we want to take the old stories and mix them with new stories and, and not, Fox's Book of Martyrs is old. Yeah. So you have all the old stories. And he was like, we want to do modern, middle and old. We were just like, that's exactly what we want to do. That's that. And, and so then that's where he uh, then reached out to Voice of the Martyrs to get the stories and it all evolved from there. You know, these guys are musicians, they're not authors. And so it was a way that we were like, wow, their platform is big. Why not shine the light on these stories and make the stories the star than not, you know, these uh, celebrities who want to write a book about, you know, whatever. And so we really felt good about that, that that way we could shine the light on these stories. What were your expectations, Michael, about this? Because... I mean, you had an album, you had a brand that people recognized. Did you think this was going to be as big as it was, or did that kind of take you by surprise? We had no idea. I mean, as we said, we do music, and you know, <laughs> the book world was something brand new to us, uncharted territory. But we've always been a curious band and wanting to use other platforms to get the message out. And what a beautiful marriage of a great song, a great premise, a great book. But the book came out, and I thought, okay, this isn't, you know, because I remember Fox Books Mars, the original one, and it was kind of all the old English words, the dust, thou, and hence was a little <laughs> tough on me. And then I read some of the mock-up stories for the book, the actual stories are condensed, and I really honestly enjoyed them. I thought, this, if this connects, it can be big. And to answer your question, we had no idea how big and impactful the book would have, would impact culture. Not to mention it became a source book in a lot of schools. So, um, man, no complaints, sir. Praise God for that. That's good. That's good stuff. So, at what point did you realize this is huge? <laughs> this is taken off. Exactly when, when I went home to Washington D.C. Uh, with my African American counterparts, my, my family, and they were like, "Uncle Mike, that book, Jesus Freaks, is amazing." Like, you can know 14, 15 year old nieces and nephews that are loving it and getting it and the stories. And like, when they ask, "Is this true?" You know, what happened here? What I was like, guys. This is, this is, this, we were on to something big. Because when kids get, you know, you know, kids are kids. A lot of times they're distracted. And so are adults for that matter these days. But uh, when I saw my family get into the book and get excited about it, I knew we had something special. And then not to mention, obviously, on the road, people talking about it after they came out and going places. Because I got the book or you hear stories about the book. Um, it was amazing. Dan, maybe you know the answer to this. How was VOM selected to be the source for those stories? Yeah, that came through Pat Judd in because we felt like, hey, again, we're we're a band, like we're not experts on this. So 
we just felt like we needed to find a partner that had credibility in this area. And so for us, the known entity, like, wow, if we could partner with them, they, they know about this. They, they've been walking in it. And so we just felt like they would be a great partner in it. And it's interesting. God has used it to bless VOM in really remarkable ways as well, because it put, for a lot of people, it put us on their radar that they'd never heard of VOM. They didn't know there was a ministry to persecuted Christians. Maybe they didn't even know Christians were still being persecuted. Uh, so it was, I mean, I think you said beautiful marriage. It really yes, was it was, a beautiful yeah. marriage for us as well uh, and has produced amazing stories of, of people who say, I first heard about you when I picked up the book, Jesus Freaks. I, I signed up to get the magazine when I saw that book and I got the card, I filled it out and I've been reading the magazine for 20 years now. So the reason we're talking about this now, though, is because there's a new generation of Jesus Freaks why? Why another book? Why a new book, Jesus Freaks? Well, I mean, let's face it. I mean, we're ever evolving as people. The world is, and there's um, people that came that are born now. We found today, 25 years ago, Jesus Freaks came out in November. I'm thinking to myself, I know 25 year old kids. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's a brand new time. I'm like, I have 25. I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, okay? But I will say, it is. It, it, it takes you back a bit to realize, you know, so much has changed. That being said, um, the, the message is never old, never gets old, and it needs to be told, you know, as time goes on to, to, new, to new generations. And when I when I thought to myself, the impact this book could have and, and does have, and then and even the title, Jesus Freak, the song, the, the the lyric, the whole stance, it's like, it's it's convicting. To what to what whatever age is convicting because you think, you know, I'm just asked to live my life of faith out loud, you know. I'm not asked to, you know, just live my faith. I mean, these guys died for their faith, you know, and, and so I'm and think how pathetic I've been at times when I haven't lived that out, or I don't live it out, or I have a, a tough or rough day. Give me a break, man. These guys are like on the front line. As a matter of fact, I gotta share this. I read this this morning, my devotional from Rick Reiner, uh, from uh James. 112 and Revelation 2.10, referring to the crown of life mm -hmm. that goes to the, the martyr. This crown is often referred to as the martyr's crown because it's given to those who suffered for their faith, those who died for Christ, or those who were committed to finishing their race of faith, regardless of the difficulties they encountered in this life. We all have tough times, you know, losing kids, losing moms or dads, or you and I have um, going through hard times in life. But the fact is, the true test of character, I think, and, and God will honor this, is a man or woman that is sought to him and is following him through those tough times. You don't have to finish the race first, just endure. Just, you know, you know end the race, finish the race. But it's like him to the swift, it's giving those who endure. So um, as Jesus freaks, that's what we're called to do. And I think it's, 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 that message is timely for now and the past and the future. Why do you think the stories are so powerful that, that people mostly American Christians, most of us who have never encountered persecution, and yet we dive into the pages of this book and there's something that we have to keep reading. I want to read the next story. What do you think that draw is? I'm not sure this is the perfect analogy, but it's kind of like driving past an accident scene. You don't want to see a leg or, or a body part missing. You kind of go, you know, looking over with your heart, Kind of beating, pitter pattering. Same thing with the book. You read the book; it's a, it's it's sensational, not in a sense of disrespect, but it's like these things happen to people. So, if you have part of a heart, any emotion at all, uh, let alone a believer, you're going to read this. You're going to put yourself in that position, thinking, "Man, could I do this? Could I have done this? Would I have done this? Would I do this?" It's intense. So that's that connection is is real, and you can't. It's 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 a it's a beautiful thing. You can't deny that. I think the stories are timeless. You know, they really are, and. I do think it really does challenge your faith as you're trying to wrestle with your faith in a country, you know, the, with the wealth of America and all that. And it brings you back. It, it kind of brings the perspective back and it, it asks you to ask yourself, like, what am I willing to pay to stand up for Christ? And so I think it helps you when, you know, it's hard because in society, it, you know, it's it, you can be make fun of these days if you have Christian beliefs and things like that. So things like that, it helps you walk through, you know, standing up for Jesus, speaking about him. And when you get that pushback, you these stories really give you strength and courage. And, That's a good point, Dan, because yeah. you, you read these stories, all of a sudden you go, well, 
I was, you know, moaning and whining about this, that, and the other. Oh my gosh, this guy got his head chopped off. Right. Think about that, you know, just because he was preaching the gospel, doing doing the will of the Father. You know, you know, you, you might be half stepping or, or just whatever. But in fact, you, you really go, well, I'm just going to shut up right about now because this is this is this is a real walk of faith, real life. And I love what you said about you read the story and you say, okay, what would I do in that situation? Because I think that's a very powerful question for people to ask. Because what happens after you ask that is you say, I'm not sure what I would do. And so then you have to go to prayer. Uh -huh. You have to go to the scriptures and you have to say, Lord, I want to be say that I would do exactly what they and did. That I would Because you want to. Yeah. Like, yeah. I like to believe that Lori Anderson, Dan Pitts, Michael Tate would just do that. But don't think twice about it. You know, walk to the guillotine, if you will. Walk to the, to the, the hanging noose or whatever. And just, you know, for your faith. It's either God or you're out of here, pal. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay. I see my last Netflix flick, flicks for the night, or my, <laughs> my last news voice concert, my last DC Talk concert, who knows, you know? It, it boggles the mind in a good way. Yeah. And the heart. And the heart. It, it definitely boggles the heart. Yes, it does. Were there stories that were in the original book that when we started talking about a second book, you're like, well, we have to have that story still. <laughs> don't, don't take that story out of there or we're not having it. But it's funny, you talk to different people and this one is mm -hmm. like what really, yeah. and, and, and then, you know, we have biblical stories like Stephen, the first martyr. And so uh, it was always to kind of keep the gist of the original and, and pull some new stuff in. But we had collected so many stories from all kinds of different sources. There was always plenty of material. The new book is about 65 to 70% from the original content and about 30% is new material, and not new material from before 1999, but new material that has happened, new stories that have been written in the last 20 years of new Jesus freaks that have laid down their lives in the last 20 years. So it's a good reminder that this is not just something that happened a long time ago. There's people right now who are living out their Jesus freak story. Michael, your dad was a pastor. And so I think you probably from an early age understood the power of story. Did, did he use some of these stories or, or did he, was he impacted by some of these stories? Little did I know, was it Richard Wormbrand, right? Richard Wormbrand. Yeah, little did I know uh, the story of that, of, of, of his life uh, until my dad uh, spoke about it from the pulpit one day. And I still didn't relate it, connected with, to this whole thing, you know, what we're talking about. From what I remember, I want to try to quote it exactly. From what I remember, it was pretty impactful of course listening to it i was thinking to myself who would do this you know my dad's preached i thought and once again jumping ahead to now no clue we'd be in this moment i thought i'm not sure i could do that dad so yeah when i heard that my dad spoke about that from the pulpit in an effort to get people more into more into missions uh get them more interested in what's going on outside of their little world the little fence of their yard the little area they live in and uh it was impacting me as a 15 year old kid 13 year old kid yeah no question dan you have a family background in, in persecuted church ministry also, as I understand it, through your dad. Can, can you talk a little bit about his history with persecuted Christians? Absolutely. He grew up really in the Philippines. My grandfather was in World War II and went over with um, MacArthur uh -huh. and to the Philippines. And so my grandfather's on the ship when they went in, and he felt God call him as a missionary. And so he got out of the war, the work was over, and he went to the Philippines. So my dad spent most of his life there. So there was a, a sensitivity to God working in other nations. And he, they worked with the headhunters, kind of the really the yeah. tribes deep. So he had this sensitivity to Christians in hard places. And so he later became a U.S. congressman. And so he really had a real passion to use his influence as an international representative of the United States. And so he was able to advocate for Christians around the world. And if he was in Russia or if he was, you know, in the Middle East and somewhere, he had connections with the underground churches and different things. And they would let him know if a certain pastor was in prison. And so he would advocate for them. And that would a lot of times help get them released because you know, if they can keep it quiet and hidden, it's all good. So he was able to advocate for persecuted Christians all over the world. And that was just kind of, 
a side thing that he did just because of his heart of kind of growing up in different parts of the world and knowing the persecution that goes on if he if he could advocate for them he would that doesn't necessarily make your dad popular with other governments if he's willing to go into those countries and say well wait a minute how are you treating the church how are you treating the christians that's pretty bold yeah he and now he's very diplomatic he uh, sad to say in our current state he had a true respect for the other side and and that's other nations so he worked with a lot of ambassadors and so you find common ground even if you're at odds with one another you find you can get much more done when you treat each other with respect and dignity so he he had that ability like he wouldn't do it like to shame them or it's like hey we know this is a person that that we know you know this is a good person he's not being treated right and we think you you guys need to do something about that and so it was not in a threatening or yeah it was really out of a relationship and because he had the relationship with the ambassadors he's he's able then to talk to them about some other things and he understood diplomacy and how you do that and you actually can be more effective when you have a dialogue than with then you're yelling at each other we're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Michael Tate and Dan Pitts about the reissued book, Jesus Freaks. A brand new edition of the book has just come out. You can order it. In fact, if you'll come to vomradio.net, we'll give you a link where you can order it. Uh, Dan, I think that that diplomacy is one of the blessings of growing up in a different culture. Um, just understanding that they have a way of seeing things that's completely different from yours and and equally valid. (laughs) Yes. What do you want, and I'll ask this to both of you, people read the new version of Jesus Freaks, they close the book, they've read all the stories, what do you want them to do? What do you want the impact to be? For me, when I read it, I want them to practically speak and make it a part of your daily devotional. You know, you read it. That's that's a great part about it because these stories, they come out of dark place, a lot of them, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of reality, right on the dark side, if you will. These little stories, it's a little, a little more so can impact you. Read it in the morning time, think about it, take notes on it, and uh, and then live your life accordingly. Let it impact you like that. That's just one way. Yeah, I would just say, I, I hope that it does give kids yeah. strength and courage to stand up for what is right, you know, when they're in school, you know, I think I I feel for kids today, I feel like there's an onslaught on them that has never been the access to evil is so easy. And so you're made fun of if you're not into this, or you're not on this social media, or you're not, you know, and so it's really hard for a kid to walk through and not be made fun of if you just don't go with where the tide is right now. And so to me, I hope that this book gives them courage to be like, okay, I'm going to stand up for what I believe is right. And I'm going to trust, you know, that God will send friends to me, you know, and if not, I'm going to hold on and I can look at these guys that have come before and, you know, they stood strong. And so I, I hope it gives kids courage to, to, you know, walk the path that God would want them to pop, to walk during this time, which I think is really hard for kids. And I think, it's interesting because you said there was a story you heard as a kid and for year, you you're still talking about it today. I think there's some stories in this book that are going to be like that for some of the young people who read it. It's going to be that story that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, they'll be telling to their grandkids, hey, I read this story in this book. Um, so there really is that power in those stories. Michael, I'm going to ask you one last question. How would you say your faith has been impacted by stories of persecuted Christians? Or is there any truth or any practice that you have taken from some of their stories and said, hey, I wanna, I wanna be like that. I wanna make sure that's a fact in my life as well. Well, one thing I'll be real vulnerable and say, one thing I struggle with as a believer is really exercising just reckless abandoned faith, just trusting God. To, there are times like, if God didn't answer enough time for me, I go, okay, God, Sit up for this one. I'm going to go take care of it myself. I'll come back and get you when I need you kind of thing, you know? And it's not, that's not how it works. You either believe it or you don't. There's no gray area. The gray area is made, it's, it's made by the weak, I think. I think it's black and white. Um, <laughs> truly. <laughs> don't edit that. <laughs> but um, and the truth is, uh, um, it increases my faith. I'm like, because this is, this, is, this is not 
fog or this is not, you know, fictitious. This is real stuff. And when you read it, you have, like I said, if you have any any part of your cognitive existence has any kind of feeling, emotion, you know, sensitivity, whatever, you're going to read this. It's going to affect you. So it makes you realize, you know what? This, these, these people waited on God and God delivered. Yeah, they might have lost their life on this side, but they gained their life because we know, the, we know the end of the story. So, yeah, it's a faith thing for me, big time. Is there a particular quality that you see in persecuted Christians, whether it's one of these stories or another story that you've heard, where you've kind of said, I want that quality to be true of me as well? Yeah, I, I again, I think there's so many, which is why I, I, I still like to read through the stories even mm-hmm. after having read them all, you know, because... Again, I think perseverance is a huge part of our walk. Like as humans, we, we, we give up easy and if we can. And again, in a society that's affluent, it's easier. You can do a lot of things to escape. So I think that just the perseverance that God calls us to, I think a book like this helps you persevere through whatever it is, even if it's not persecution, if it's a hard relationship, you know, I think that's one of the characteristics that, you know, Christians had when you think about the early church. I mean, they were persecuted, they were oppressed, you know, they had, they couldn't meet in public and yet they stayed at it. And because they knew that's where life was. And so for me, I think that's one of the strongest qualities. It, it, It helps me keep turning back when I might want to chase something, you know, to escape with you know and and just you know get away with espn or football for me (laughs) as we were talking about but um you know and i think it helps keep me refocused back to what matters and um i think a lot of times we we coast and i think this book really helps bring you back to what matters another very important point i think is when you you think about these are real human human beings of course men and women who have put aside all the trappings, put aside all the things that would usually ensnare people, a lot of us, and they've literally given their lives for their faith. And like I said in the beginning, and all we ask is to live for our faith. That's convicting, no matter how you look at it. And uh, this book, when you read these stories, once again, it, 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 it'll, 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 it'll stick you pretty good. We put our time, our money, our effort into so many things that, as my dad says, it's all gonna burn one day, so to speak. But these things here, you know, the, the, real, the real truth and the real jewel is that these people did not hold onto their earthly possessions. That was not their, their life. It, it, it was this or bust. No, these people gave it all, all to walk one way. And that's, the, that, and that's, that's, a, that's a narrow road, a tough, narrow road. And not only just walk, but long obedience, stay on that road and finish, finish the job. Well done, my good and faithful servant. We're here with Michael Tate and Dan Pitts talking about the brand new edition of the book, Jesus Freaks. We will give you a link at vomradio.net where you can go and purchase a copy of the book. Dan and Michael, thank you so much for sharing your heart. Uh, and thanks for talking about this book because it it has impacted a generation. Uh, I remember I interviewed a, a potential staff member at VOM. He said his first contact with VOM was picking up a copy of Jesus Freaks, wow. and he he's a graphic designer, and he loved the way the pages were rough uh-huh. on the spine. Uh-huh. And, and it was like, hey, I had to pick that up and see how they did that. And then I thought, well, that's from, oh, that's about persecution. Oh, that's from Voice of the Martyrs. And like 10 years later, he sent a resume and came down and interviewed and eventually came and worked at VOM. But his first contact was picking up a copy of Jesus Freaks. And that's one of tens of thousands of stories of people who said the first time they encountered VOM, the first time they encountered modern day persecuted Christians was picking up a copy of Jesus Freak. So you have done a great service to the body of Christ and we are thankful. I'm thankful on behalf of VOM. So let me just say, Todd, on behalf of Toby Mack and Kevin Max, who aren't here right now, um, we are beyond stoked and proud and happy to be a part of something that is eternal. Uh, this book has blessed lots of people. No question about the book number two. Hope blesses another whole generation, even in the past. But uh, we, we are very thankful that God allowed us to come together on paths across uh, for this once perfect mar- marriage. You've been listening to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. As always, if you are just joining us, you will want to go to vomradio.net and listen to this conversation in its entirety. You can also find VOM Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. 
I hope you'll join us next week as we continue to talk about what God is doing around the world through our persecuted brothers and sisters. Thank you for being with us.